Maddie's Slitters. It's okay, I don't know what's going on with my hair either. I'm drinking Coke again in today's video because I love making the same mistake over and over again. I mean, just look at my string of ex-boyfriends. I was also fully in the middle of filming another video and then this idea came to me and I had way more enthusiasm for it. So I, this is not scripted, this is not planned. We're going off the cuff and as we all know, that's when people produce their best quality product. Okay, so this came from a couple different ideas. Number one is that I used to work at a bookstore Hold your gasps. And when you work at a bookstore, you're often expected to have staff picks and you know be able to talk about what books are about to people who are asking. And secondly, is that I was talking to a new friend about some of my favorite books, and I came across this problem yet again. And that is when you have a book that you're trying to describe, and for whatever reason, it always comes out sounding weird or bad, or like you can't quite find the right word for how it made you feel. It's, uh, it's really good. This thing happens with this girl and like she's, uh, she can go through time, but like not in a, not, but like in a science way. And that other person is just standing there like, oh, uh, yeah, sounds uh, great. Um, where did you say that the Aquatar shelf was? There are some books that I love that are just really hard to sell people. So without further ado, grab a drink, grab a snack, and <laughs> get ready for me fumbling my way through trying to sell you on some of my favorite books of all time. And hopefully I can do it. <laughs> we'll start off with the one that I was trying to talk to this person about, and that is Space Opera by Catherine M. Valente. The best way I can think to describe this is to talk about dark forest theory, which is a philosophical theory to explain why we haven't found aliens yet, which boils down to probably other aliens know about us, they're just not making contact with us. And that is the basis of this novel, where every couple thousand years there is a intergalactic talent competition that is full of the sentient beings of the universe. And whenever they find a new planet of sentient beings, someone from that planet is brought to the talent competition to lip sync for their life, because if they are found wanting, galactic Council will obliterate the planet. And our main character is a washed up rock star who accidentally gets themselves put in the position of representing Earth. So it's this absolutely ridiculous, music filled glitter bomb of a talent competition that gets real existential. And it has some of the coolest writing that I've ever read, which I know will not be for everybody. The way that she crafts this book is with these super long, extended sentences from here to here is one sentence. <laughs> it's very clear that neither myself nor Catherine Valente would survive very well in ancient Greece because they didn't have commas. And this book is basically made of glittery lipstick pyrotechnics and grammar loopholes. If you are looking for a queer sci-fi that's gonna rock your world, nay, your universe, that also is just like so fun and weird and wild, I would highly, highly recommend this book. I think it's so unique. And once you get into the writing style, it's a really engaging and different way of telling the story. Secondly is another book that I constantly had my staff pick sticker on that no one would ever buy because it's so weird to talk about because it's such a mashup of genres. And that is uh, my beloved The Bone Season by Samantha Shannon. This book is five genres in a trench coat holding both a laser gun and a sword. It's so seamlessly woven together that you don't even realize that it is so many little bits of things. She she makes it work. Set in a futuristic London, this is an alternate reality where people have paranormal powers and are kept under control by the Scion government. And our main character Paige is a dreamwalker, a kind of clairvoyant who can break into people's heads and see what their deepest desires are through their dreams. She is also part of an underground crime syndicate and one day when she gets kidnapped off the train, she ends up getting taken to a camp that's run by angels, but not really angels. They're these other beings who have come through to our world because their world is dying and they need paranormal people like on their side, but they're also like slowly killing them and the earth. And she is assigned to a refam named Warden. And their relationship is also a huge dynamic in all these books. As the series goes on, there's a lot of stuff about propaganda, paranormal world. In some of the later books, we get to see the crime syndicates and like who belongs to what and who has what power. She has a writing style that is fast paced and engaging without seeming like she's skipping over details. But it's also so engrossing and really talks about emotions and thoughts and 
people not being good people and doing what they'll have to to survive. Truly, if any of that sounded even slightly good, please pick this up. It is one of the best series that I've ever read. It's gonna be a seven book series, and the fourth one just came out last year. We currently have no release date or title for the fifth one, so Samantha Shannon, if you could just like get on that, that would be stellar. Okay, so the third one, we're gonna go way left field. I'm bringing out something that I don't usually talk about, and that is a vampire romance novel. It did it. Hold on, just before you click away, before you laugh at me, we need to talk about Dark Lover by J.R. Ward. I know, I know, Rachel, a vampire romance novel. What is this, 2008? This is one of the most unique, complex worlds that I've ever read in any kind of vampire novel. This series focuses on the Black Dagger Brotherhood, which are a group of elite vampire warriors, mostly from royal families. And in this universe, vampires don't fight werewolves or any other paranormal creatures. They fight these beings called lessers, which are like humans that have removed their hearts and they're immortal. Also, they have this really complex religion, including a way to speak with their god as well as a very complex caste system within vampire society. There is also amazing representation in these books, especially considering that this was started in the 90s. There are so many queer characters in this. There's a character who's deaf. There's a character who's blind. There are amputees. There are people who have PTSD. There are people that have addiction problems. And while the main plotline of each book is, you know, each character getting their soulmate, there is an amazing overarching plotline that deals with their own species, with their god, with the way that they train new warriors, the relationships that they have within their own brotherhood, the relationships that vampires have within society, like questioning authority. Like these books have no right being as good as they are. Although something that does carry over from the 90s that I think is very funny is the fashion. <laughs> because everybody in here is constantly wearing leathers or turtlenecks or Doc Martens, which these days that's just like TikTok fashion. This series also has like 17 books because there are so many offshoots and truly I haven't found like a bad one yet. God, I'm gonna give myself whiplash because we're talking about a very opposite book to Dark Vampire Romance. We're talking about a YA sci-fi. Again, hard sell because it's kind of weird, but it was one of my favorite books of 2021 and it is one of the most unique plots I've ever heard. So come with me on this journey. What if Siri took over heaven? Do you want to read that? I want to read that. And oh hey, you can. It's called The Infinity Courts by Akemi Don Bowman. This book slapped so hard, I would take it to my afterlife. Like, move over, Dante's Inferno. The Infinity Courts is the new girl in town. I'm so sorry, that was incredibly niche. <laughs> this follows a girl named Nami who, after getting into an accident, finds herself in an afterlife waiting space. But it turns out that the smart device of Earth named Ophelia has found a way to upload its consciousness into the afterlife and has turned it into this alternate reality, virtual reality, AI landscape. After escaping the initial interaction with Ophelia, she ends up going with a bunch of other souls who are like not under Ophelia's control and then becoming a part of this like heaven rebellion while also sneakily infiltrating the heaven cities full of other AIs and becoming like an undercover agent. You never quite know who's telling the truth and what someone's experiences actually were versus what they have been programmed to think. And this has one of the best enemies to lovers plot lines I've read in a very long time, goddamn. Some really great plot twists, a lot of what, what makes us human? What does our morality really mean? How can we become immortal? This is such a unique blend of technology and reality and relationships and and weird existential thoughts about the afterlife. <laughs> the twist ending was great, and I just found out that the second one has officially been announced because when you get to the end of the first one, you're gonna want the second one. Like, if I had a smartwatch, it probably would have registered me finishing this book as a heart attack. Okay, so second to last is one that is maybe a little bit of an easier sell than some of the other ones mostly because I talk about it so damn much on this channel that uh, you're probably sick and tired of me mentioning it, but we're still gonna talk about it because it's thematically appropriate. And I'm under the philosophy, if you pick a theme or an aesthetic, you gotta commit. So let me quickly talk about The Raven Boys by Maggie Stiefvater. This is kind of hard to talk about because it's just a little weird enough that a lot of people will not know how to categorize it. I say this falls under light fantasy or magic realism, which by itself is also hard to sell. And like ancient Welsh kings, who cares about those these days? You know what I do? 
I do, and once you read this, you will too. This follows our five main characters of Gansey, Adam, Ronan, Noah, and Blue as they go on a bit of a quest to awaken a dead Welsh king that is said to be buried on a ley line. And if you wake him up, he will grant whoever wakes him a favor. Blue is a psychic's daughter who has a tap on the paranormal world, and Gansey himself is a bit of a treasure hunter with a reputation. His best friend Adam ends up accidentally getting way more involved in this search to be able to change his own fate. And Vicious Ronan is a loyal friend friend who has his finger on the pulse of dreams. And their search along the ley line for Glendower brings them to these amazing magical forests and has to do with pulling things out of dreams and figuring out what is reality and how time works in different places. The relationships in here are truly some of the best I've ever read. They're so heartwarming and amazing. I will leave a link to the video of my tattoo tour to show off uh, my ink and like what it means to me. Oh, I do need to film a new one of those soon because I've gotten a couple more since then and one of them is slightly to do with the Raven Boys. <laughs> Oops. So if you want unsettling forests and weird time slips, but also phenomenal character cores and a big found family and like amazing relationships, I would highly, highly recommend that you give this a shot. I actually had to read it twice to actually understand and like it, but once I did, I mean, it's pretty clear we're here now. And okay, I have a spicy low camera battery. We're gonna try and get this one last one in before I have to charge my camera. The last one, I can confidently say, is my favorite book, which makes it so much harder to sell people when you say it's your favorite and then you don't know the words to describe it. But after talking about it so often, I think I've got my pitch down pretty well, so hear me out. The Starless Sea by Erin Morgenstern is about a fantastical library that exists outside of space and time, and the only way to get there is if it offers you a door. And when it offers you a door, it will give you a motif of a key, a bee, and a sword. Our main character, Zack, had a door offered to him when he was much younger and never took it, and now there's a little bit of a mystery at the beginning that makes him wonder if he'll get another opportunity to visit the library. Surprise, he ends up making it into the magical library, and from there, this book gets weird. It's full of small stories within stories, time slips and time loops, songs, secrets, magic realism, things existing in certain times. It's really hard to give a plot line outside of that, but the reason it's my favorite book is because the writing is so magical. I do not know how she does it. It makes you want something that you never knew that you wanted, and it makes you feel like there is something so much bigger than yourself, and that you could find a place where such fantastical, magical things exist. I know this book is not going to be for everybody. I have a lot of people saying that they hated this book because, again, it's so bizarre. It's definitely a one of a kind, but it just makes me feel so many things that I'm just like, I want to cry whenever I think about it. I just want to cry. I really like how that's become a thing in the book community where we're like, this book devastated me. It made me sob. It made me cry. It was awful. I threw it across the room. It's perfect. You should read it. And if you go to my tattoo tour video, my tattooer, you will see that I happen to have ink of this as well. So, you know, if I have it permanently on my body, that it meant a lot to me. Oh my god, I did it. I still have camera battery left. We're gonna wrap this up real quick. There you have it. There are a list of six books. Si wait, six books? Six books. <laughs> We've established this. You come to the channel for the books, not the math. Those are six books that I really, really love that I have such a hard time pitching to other people because of their outlandish plot lines or their super weird magic down to their sentence structure being bizarre. To me, these are books where genre blending, genre mashups, interesting grammar points kind of all come together and made something that I absolutely love that spoke to whatever's left of my soul. I made that joke to a friend the other day and they're like, why do you keep going on about like not having a soul. And I'm like, I'm sorry, have you never met a redhead before that lived through the 2010s? What? Please leave down below some books that you find beautiful or wonderful or are super, super cool, but are just really hard to pitch to people. And then bonus challenge is you try and pitch it to me in a couple sentences or less. And if you need practice, just go work at a bookstore. You'll get that pitch down in no time. Some of the worst parts of that job were like trying to talk to somebody about a book that you love and just watching the light slowly leave their eyes as you're just there like sputtering, trying to communicate why you love it. But those bookstore days are far behind me and I don't have to worry about it too much because everybody on the the internet is weird too. <laughs> you know where to click to like the video, you know where to click to subscribe. I hope you guys are all having a nice day wherever you are and I will see you all next week. Bye!